has been wrapped in flames again, again and again, consumed by madness, torn from tranquility. The courage and terrible sacrifice of unknown soldiers has been scratched in our imaginations since as children we learned first of 1914, then the 1940s, then the long Cold War. Rising from the chaos of divided nations, NATO, led by the United States, created a deterrent to military aggression. Europe has been exposed to two world wars, not simply by the aggression of one nation, but the lack of preparedness of many nations. France and Belgium in particular were unable to defend themselves against the mighty Germany because of poor military planning and ineffective political alliances. NATO sought to change that narrative by providing a strong deterrent to invasion and a fierce capacity to counterattack. agreement. The core of the NATO partnership. An attack against one was an attack against all. In order to live in peace together, all were resolved to defend themselves together if necessary. NATO's first responsibility is to protect its almost one billion citizens. In Warsaw, NATO acted to modernize its collective defense and deterrence. So as NATO met in Warsaw, Poland, a new era was set in motion. A step change occurred. The European Union formalized a declaration with NATO which binds Europe's institutional capacity with the pooled military resources of NATO's members. Well, I think that NATO re-established itself as the cornerstone of security for Europe vis-a-vis -vis the new threats, uh, certainly with a very strong and articulated position vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Russian Federation and Putin's policies. Uh, of course, coming from Croatia for us was important to see that there is also a message that the uh, enlargement is alive, that there is an open door policy for Southeast Europe that is important. Is this a step change in NATO's history? Yeah, I think it was uh, a very reassuring summit, um, meeting the challenges and the threats that we have from the east and from the south, uh, real resolve on the part of the alliance, stepping up defence expenditure on the part of alliance allies, uh, new structures to put in place, new deterrent structures, increased flexibility and mobility, all the right things, so showing real resolve. My concern is that here we had a summit in Warsaw. I think that was to create a bit of tension, particularly with Russia, and to also but to demonstrate that here we had a united front in Europe post-Brexit. And then on top of that, I think that we are facing NATO looking at, at being in it for the long haul, and what we're going to experience is potentially a long war. Since its last summit in 2014, the NATO response force is now three times bigger. It has set up the first six new small headquarters in the eastern part of the alliance, boosting its ability to plan, exercise and reinforce if needed, augmenting Turkey's air defenses and it has developed a strategy to deal with hybrid threats. Its three core tasks are principally collective defense, crisis management and cooperative security. The most important challenge to NATO presently, as far as I can see, is whether the Eastern European countries, in particular Poland and the Baltic states, and their Western European partners can agree on a common Russia policy. And there I'm not convinced that the internal differences and distinctions have all been overcome. It seems a little complicated when not all EU member states are members of NATO. How does this work at Council and when it comes to Parliament for voting? But we do example? share the same values. The, the, the values that uh, both the European Union and NATO uh, uh, are, are sharing are the values of, of democracy, the values of the rule of law, uh, regardless of uh, the fact that some countries are members of one organization and not the other. Uh, and based on, on, on sharing these values, we need to enhance our cooperation. It's essential. On the one hand, you cannot be, be here trying to be presenting yourself as in some way impartial and then be a part of that military aggression in NATO. I think collectively, ourselves in Ireland are very concerned about Ireland's neutrality. And what we have been calling for is a legally binding protocol for Ireland so that Ireland's neutrality is protected.
The Warsaw Summit sought to deal with Russia's annexation of Crimea, its military buildup from the Barents Sea to the Baltic and from the Black Sea to the Eastern Mediterranean. It also dealt with turmoil across the Middle East and North Africa, which is fueling the biggest migrant and refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. I would imagine many people will see it as a militarization of a humanitarian crisis. Let's be very clear, NATO and the EU created the refugee crisis that we are in at this moment, the humanitarian crisis, by their aggression. Um, in the Middle East and in also parts of Africa. And what we need is open arms, not military arms, greeting the thousands of people that are trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea. The EU has had a common security and defence policy for the best part of 20 years. In one of the founding documents at the time of the Nice uh, European Council in 2000, it was spelt out in black and white that CSDP, the common security and defence policy, will not constitute a European army. And then in the Treaty of Lisbon, the current treaty, I'm pulling on my anorak now, but Article 42.7 uh, says that for its members, NATO will remain the foundation, not a foundation, the foundation for the collective defence of its members. So I think people are quite clear that there are distinct, complementary, but very distinct roles for the EU and NATO to play. We have two organisations that uh, live in the same city but in two different planets. We cannot afford that anymore. We cannot have that luxury anymore. Uh, so the, all what we can do in order to uh, enhance that cooperation should be supported. The EU is not relevant to the military development that we require. It's not relevant to the defence deterrent uh, status that we need to have. Uh, and don't forget that 22 out of the 28 EU members are NATO allies. So we have one defence alliance, it's called NATO. We don't need another. Do you think that this will completely um, remove the argument for an EU army if the EU and NATO are working Well, nobody's better? talking about an EU army. Oh, they are uh, No, uh, they, I don't believe anybody really truly is. It's not about a European army. It's simply about a more coherent European defence effort because unless that happens, uh, the current situation where the US provides you know, always the bulk of the forces and provides 70% of the totality of NATO defense budgets, that is going to continue and that's not going to be a good argument in the United States for when it comes to fair burden sharing across the Atlantic. So the Europeans obviously have got to contribute more. I hope we never see a European army. I'm against federalism. I'm against the establishment of the creation of such an army. I think what we need to do is de-escalate situations, particularly around the borders of Europe. When you consider, you look at whether it's Syria, um, you know, even you look at, at what's happening in Palestine, you look at Turkey, all of the borders around Europe, there are difficulties, there are problems, and Europe's part of the creation of those problems. So the last thing, the last thing that Europe needs is a European army. The term EU army is something for the distant future. It is nothing to, to work operationally on. I think we should, as we speak, we should concentrate on activating the relevant articles of the Lisbon Treaty and thereby strengthen the European pillar of NATO. Clearly that's, that's not in the cards for any foreseeable future, but there, there is new ambition within the EU to play a more important role with regard to security. But there is also confusion. What do Americans do when they hear talk that the EU may create an army of its own? Well, it's pretty unrealistic at this point for the EU to have those discussions as they're beginning to have discussions to how members exit. Um, I, they, they need to I think focus on, in the interim before they determine what their final membership structure is going to be, how do they more effectively cooperate with NATO, which truly provides the security of Europe. In 2015, for the first time in many years, NATO registered a small increase in defence spending among European allies and Canada, and estimates for 2016 indicate a further increase in real terms. However, the new EU-NATO declaration called on both the EU and NATO to invest the necessary political capital and resources to make this reinforced partnership a success. This seemingly bland phrase has deep implications for how the EU budget could be used for military purposes. The Americans have been very critical of Europe's lack of investment in defence. Is that going to change? 
Well, this is a long-standing issue. It's nothing new there. And it's, of course, important that uh, we, as uh, members of Parliament, including members of the European Parliament, that also can communicate with our constituencies in our member states, reinforce that message. It's important to, to have a proper funding for our defence sector. If we look at uh, the EU, while it is not in war but in peacetime, we could, if uh, the uh, political will is there, out of our budget finance, for instance, the housing for uh, the troops that are going to be stationed in the four countries. We could strengthen the transport corridor for our troops, but not only for them, by, for instance, stepping up the efforts to build the, the railway link between Poland and the Baltic states that goes through this famous Sovaki corridor. That is one of the European transport corridors and that can be with additional money um, accelerated. I'm not sure that the the collaboration between NATO and the EU has been well sorted out and I'm completely critical of some of the new initiatives within the EU that tend to go in the direction of using some of the EU's budget to finance military expenditure. I think that should be a no-go. Austerity killed military spending in Europe. Before that, Prosperity weakened military spending as European nations became used to the idea of peace, threats seemed more distant and less likely. Deterrence became weak and readiness failed just as it did before 1914 and for the same reasons that Europe was so easily overrun in 1940. Governments believed there would be peace in our time. NATO is not the problem. NATO has guaranteed our security and safety over decades now and long may it continue to be so. The important thing about NATO, it binds the transatlantic allies to the European allies for our common defense of the democracies. We have to reassure our Eastern NATO member countries, but at the same time, there has to be a clear signal that we're willing not only to push back against Russian aggression, but also to get involved in dialogue with Russia, which will continue to be a necessary element of what NATO should pursue. Today, Europe faces serious and persistent threats on all fronts. Without NATO, Europe would be left dangerously exposed to the ambitions of Russia and the angry range of intercontinental ballistic missiles. Some argue that without NATO, there would be less conflict, less incentive to profit from war. That wasn't the lesson of 1914 or 1940. Warsaw still bears the deep wounds of German, then Russian flames. It was not Europe's military spending that led to war, but rather it was a lack of preparedness, a lack of coordination, a lack of threat awareness. The new EU-NATO declaration is written on the blood-soaked uniforms of unknown soldiers, lest we forget. <laughs>